muted. We'll be starting our meeting here in just a few minutes, actually about a couple of minutes. Give everybody a few more minutes to log in. Well, good afternoon, everyone. We're about ready to start our session today. I, I'd like uh, to check our sound by asking Robert if he can uh, hear me okay. I hear you great, Craig. Okay, super. Well, I'll be making some introductory comments before we get started here today. Hope everybody can hear me okay, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our webcast today. We're very excited to have Robert Green with us to share his best practices for CAD technology planning. He will be reviewing key issues that all businesses should consider in planning for your 2016 and beyond, such as Autodesk software licensing, hardware changes, work process, and training. Our goal at Midwest CAD is to help our customers get maximum return on your total CAD investment. My name is Craig Parton, and from our, our offices at Midwest CAD, we'll be helping Robert with the webcast today. I will monitor questions that you can submit using the chat window on the side of your screen. And we ask you to address those questions or comments to the organizer. Throughout the presentation, we'll have stopping points to answer questions and make this interactive as possible. We encourage you to type your questions, even discussion items you may want to have with Robert later, and overall feedback about the meeting using our chat window. And we will follow up later if we don't get to your questions during the webcast. So next, I'm going to be turning it over to Robert Green. Quick introduction for him. He is a mechanical engineer and has been a private CAD consultant since 1991. He focuses on CAD management, and you may have read his articles in Catalyst Magazine, read his books, or seen him speak at Autodesk University over the last 20 years, 21 years that he has presented there, or at our own CAD Midwest Technology Expo that he's presented for about seven years. So his advice comes from practical experience from working with hundreds of CAD organizations over the years. So we're glad to have Robert with us. And without further ado, I'll be turning it over to him for our meeting today. Robert, are you ready to go? Ready to roll. Thanks for the introduction, Craig. You bet. So welcome. Um, what we wanted to kind of put together for you, and I would very much like to thank Midwest CAD for making this possible um, and sponsoring it, is just kind of a, um, a year-end kind of checklist for everyone out there who's, who's responsible for CAD resource planning or 
maybe your CAD managers or power users. Um, just, you know, what should you be looking at and what should you be doing to make sure that you're set up for success in the coming year? There's a few things that are happening at the at the end of this year for Autodesk clients that, that make planning uh, perhaps a little bit more urgent and, and something that has to absolutely be done before the start um, of next year or at least by the end of January because of some licensing changes, which I'll get into momentarily. So what we wanted to do was kind of roll through four logical sessions of this. And just uh, I'll kick it off by saying this. Getting the most out of your software ecosystem, and by ecosystem I mean everything associated with, with running CAD, getting the most from that software ecosystem is going to require a balance. It's going to require great software tools. It's going to require great hardware to run it on. It's going to require optimized processes so that your users uh, will be able to get the most done in the least amount of time. And of course, in order to really attain any kind of long-lasting success, you're going to have to have well-trained CAD users as well. So I'm, I, there's an old analogy that talks about a stool that has three legs. Well, I would liken the software ecosystem to a stool that has four legs. And software, hardware, process, and training are those requisite four legs. So those are the things that we'll be talking about from a planning point of view in today's presentation. So the logical question for a CAD manager or an IT director or a CAD power user who is influential or, or has to make recommendations for the CAD department's future next year, you know, the, the logical question is, how can I plan for this and build the most effective CAD ecosystem possible? You know, how, how can I set my users up so that they can win? At the same time, I have to do this in a way that's financially responsible for my company because nobody is just going to give you a blank check to buy everything that, that you may want to purchase. So there's a, an aspect of prioritization and planning that falls into this. And as I go through the four legs of the stool, I'll try to always be cognizant of how your boss um, is going to review these types of requests, be they financial or resource-based. So. We want to talk about some licensing policy changes that Autodesk is going to be rolling out through the 2016 time frame, uh, the first half of 2016 to be more accurate. I'm going to talk about some hardware technology things so that if you are influential within your IT department in terms of specifying CAD workstations, some things you should be aware of there, some things that we can look at to optimize your work processes and your training program in order to make you successful. Now, each of these is going to require certain planning and budgeting strategies. So I'll give you some, some ideas for each one of those. And as we go through each module of this, or each leg of the stool, we'll have this open for questions, and Craig will moderate that. So uh, you may just want to submit your questions about licensing policy first, and then that will be our first Q&A break. So let's go ahead and start. I don't know how much you are aware um, of what Autodesk licensing policy changes are going to mean to your organization. I can tell you that Midwest CAD is very much aware of what those changes are, and they will certainly be able to assist you. Um, you can simply get in contact with them directly, but I wanted to give you uh, an overview so that you understood what's coming at you this year, uh, that you can be as prepared as possible. Well, first of all, we have to understand that there's uh, some buzzwords or some lingo here that you're going to need to be aware of to understand the messaging that Autodesk is putting out. Now, the first type of license that we can talk about is what's called a perpetual license. Now, this is what most of us are used to when we have purchased Autodesk licenses in the past. Um, you simply buy the license. That license continues to run. I don't want to say forever because operating systems change or whatever, but you can certainly retain that license forever and run it as long as you care to. You buy it once for whatever that cost of purchase is. You then put that perpetual license on what is called a maintenance plan, and that will assure you that you will always receive the most current version of that software tool as Autodesk releases it. So a perpetual license that is kept on maintenance is essentially always going to be current 
and you're always going to be able to run that tool, no matter what. If you, however, do not opt to keep your perpetual licenses on maintenance, it will be frozen at the current release version that you have, and it will not be upgradable. And that's, that's an interesting thing to note in this policy. It will be frozen at whatever version you have, and it will not be updatable. Let's look at just a plain vanilla uh, AutoCAD license, for example. So the suggested price for that is $41.95, and then the maintenance subscription is suggested at $5.45 per year. So this gives you everything that you would need to know about what it will cost to buy it right now and what it will cost you to keep it current on a year-over-year -year basis. Now, the single license perpetual sale, that is, buying a single seat of AutoCAD, is no longer going to be available after January 31st of next year. So if you came in in the middle of February 2016 and said, I'd like to buy a seat of AutoCAD, you won't be able to. And that's not Midwest CAD saying that, that's Autodesk saying that. Now that when we talk about a single license um, type of product, we're talking about, say, just AutoCAD, not a product suite that includes several different products. But that will stop on January 31st. Now suite-based license products, this would be like a design product design suite, something along those lines. Those will no longer be offered after July 31st of next year. These are hard dates that you need to have in mind because if your company wants to purchase more of these licenses in perpetual mode so you can have them forever and ever, you're going to have to purchase them before these dates. You may want to note that in your budget and it may require you to rethink what you're going to budget for at certain times next year. So make sure you have those key dates written down and make sure you understand if your company wants to purchase any more of these perpetual seats because time is limited, particularly on single license products uh, that will be no longer offered within about 60 days from now, 70 days maybe. So the time to buy perpetual licenses really is now. Um, if you do have current perpetual licenses that are on maintenance, my recommendation to you would be to keep them. Uh, make sure that you get your maintenance subscriptions renewed. Uh, you, one call to Midwest CAD will take care of that for you, and that way you can make sure that your investment in those perpetual seats is protected. So those are some key dates and metrics for you on a perpetual license. Now what Autodesk is moving towards is what is called a desktop subscription, or you'll frequently see it referred to as rental software. Uh, not by Autodesk, but you can think of it that way. So if we come into a, a deadline time frame next year where the perpetual licenses are no longer offered, well, what can you buy? Well, you will buy a desktop subscription, which essentially gives you the right to run that software on an annual, quarterly, or monthly basis. And you will be paying a fee, an annualized, a quarterly, or monthly fee for the rental of that software. Now as soon as that desktop subscription lapses, uh, within some period of time where the license manager checks, that software will simply not work anymore. So it will be an ongoing rental renewal uh, type of mechanism that you will need to use to keep your desktop subscriptions current. To use an AutoCAD example, the currently quoted price from Autodesk is $16.80 per year, and that would be for a single seat rental uh, for an AutoCAD license. So this is something uh, that could certainly make a lot of sense in a temporary usage situation. You're bringing in some temporary people or you have a big project and you need to do temp staff up and in three months they'll be gone. It would certainly make sense uh, to use software rental in that type of scenario. But if you have perpetual licenses and people who use your CAD software all day, every day, the perpetual license mode probably makes the most business sense for you. Now what I've done, and I, I do have this available, um, and if you want to send in a message uh, to Craig or the, the Midwest CAD folks, we can, uh, we can get a copy of this to you. This is a software calculator that I actually did for Catalyst Magazine. And it would show you, uh, with, a, with a couple of examples here, 
what your cost scenario might be in a three-year and, and five-year rolling time frame mode, uh, looking at retaining perpetuals versus rental. And uh, so this may be a tool that could help you to understand what would make the most sense uh, for your company, you know, given your software tools and, and where you're at, and what your needs and requirements are going to be. So we can certainly make that uh, available to you. I'm having a little difficulty advancing the slides, so you may see my mouse for a second. There. So the conclusion that I want to draw in this section of the presentation is that this policy change in how your software is procured, maintained, and or rented um, in the, the coming months and years from Autodesk does require you to think about how you're going to license the software. And there can be major financial consequences um, for you depending on whether you choose to proceed in a perpetual or, or rental mode. The time to be planning for this really is now, and the time to be budgeting for it really is now. If you're the CAD manager or the IT director and you have to take a budget request to your financial officer or your, your accounting department, uh, you don't want to surprise them with this. Uh, right now you only have about 70 days for some licenses and about six months on or seven months on others. So you really do need to get your budgeting stuff lined up and understand where you are. And again, your software provider, and that, that's going to be Midwest CAD, they're going to be able to assist you. So I, I would highly recommend, and they know more about the policies and, and details than I do, so they're going to be the best people to talk to. Be in touch with them and let them go over your software resources so that you can plan for this. And then don't let this be a surprise. Um, so if you didn't know about this, uh, the time to get on this really is now. So what I'd like to do now is kind of, uh, let's check in on the chat interface. I, I've been busy presenting and I've not had a chance to look. So Craig, do we have anything stacked up in the question queue at this point? Nothing right now, Robert. You've done a good job of explaining that. But uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, just feel free to type them in. Yeah, and I cannot stress enough, you know, this is what the reseller organization does. It's what they're good at. They keep up with the policies and, you know, there may be incentives or, or things that I'm not aware of that's uh, perfectly possible. So go ahead and uh, get in touch with them and just, you know, run an audit and make sure that you understand where you're at and plan for that. We'll go ahead and move on to the next section. Then. So hardware technology, we're getting to the, the second leg of the CAD ecosystem stool here. You know, there's been a lot of changes. Um, in, in terms of hardware technology, which I guess is always true, you know, it, it's always changing, but it, it, we really have seen some fairly large increases um, in, in performance, especially some of the new chipsets that Intel is rolling out um, right now, actually, or, or over the last 30 days, is going to be making its way onto the, the workstations that you buy within the next 30 to 60 days and all through next year. So I wanted to do a look ahead there and give you some things uh, to be cognizant of, some prioritization, so that when you do buy new hardware, you make sure that you're getting something that's going to serve you well for at least the next three years out. So the first thing that I would like to say, because I see this in so many organizations, is I see fabulously expensive engineers and architects and design personnel. I mean, these are people who are being paid a lot of money per year. And they're sitting there in front of this boat anchor of a computer that's, that's running slow, which is a good case, or it's crashing, uh, I see that, or it has an outmoded uh, budget stripped down gaming graphics card that has streaks and pixels across it when they're trying to get renderings. I will never understand why companies employ high-wage people and then put them in front of a budget computer. To me, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, you have high-productivity product, high people, high-skilled people, put them in front of a high-performance machine. You're going to get more out of them that way. And I would highly encourage you, when you're asking for hardware resources, budgeting for it, that you use that argument. Right now, what we're seeing is a movement in the processor architectures uh, to really beefing up 
the core i7 processors to, to come actually kind of more in line with some of the Xeon processors, but the Xeon processors are making performance strides as well. Um, right now, for most CAD tools, unless you're a really high power analyst who's running a lot of different applications or applications that are, are truly multi-threaded, most Autodesk software application users are perfectly fine with a quad core. And they're also perfectly fine with a single processor. Four cores really is pretty much all you're going to use if you're a, you know, an AutoCAD user, a Revit user, an Inventor user. It's pretty much all you're going to take advantage of. Now, having said that, though, the bigger the cache that you can get on the processor, the better off you will be. So if you look at those specifications, you will tend to see that Xeon processors do contain bigger caches, sometimes by a, a factor of two or three to one. And it does make a difference uh, in, in terms of how much 64-bit data can be presented to the processor at any one time. The fastest RAM speed that you can possibly get is always going to be something to pay attention to. And that's a specification you'll see when you start reading the fine print. So if it's running DDR4 memory at above uh, 2 megahertz, okay, then uh, you're, you're going to be getting better performance than if it's down at 1600. Get the absolute highest clock rate processor you can get. So let's say that you're running principally AutoCAD on a workstation. Should you get a dual processor machine that has eight cores that's running at two gigahertz, or should you get a quad core, one processor, that's running at 3.7? You should go with the 3.7 single processor machine because the clock rate of the processor determines your performance. Remember, most Autodesk CAD tools are not really multi-threaded. They're not running across multiple cores, at least not more than two. So the faster that core clocks, the faster your performance is going to be. So in summary, quad-core Xeon or i7 really is kind of the sweet spot with as much cache and the highest clock rate you can get that supports the fastest RAM technology that you can get. Do this and you'll be buying an obsolescence-proofed processor that's going to work for you for at least three years. Let's move on to RAM. Now, obviously, uh, you know, the more the better when we talk about RAM, but there's some other things to be aware of in your planning or specification for new machines. You'll start to see next year that DDR4 memory technology is becoming much more prominent. Um, now, you will still see a lot of DDR3 memory technology that's being specified, and there's actually some debate about which one performs better uh, in different computing loads and scenarios. But one thing that we can definitely say is that DDR4 is going to become the prominent memory technology over the next year, and simply by economy of scale, it should become cheaper because everything's going to start using DDR4. So if I were buying a new machine today, I would tend to buy one that supports DDR4 memory technology. You obviously want to get the highest speed RAM that the processor supports. You're not saving money by buying slower RAM and putting it in a faster processor. All you're doing is loading your processor down, boat anchoring it, if you will, with slower RAM technology. So buy the fastest RAM that is supported by your processor. In a 2D CAD usage scenario, I would say minimum is a 16 gigabyte uh, RAM complement right now. If you're using even occasional 3D tools, uh, Revit, Inventor, uh, Point Clouds, things like that that are using 3D data sets inside of AutoCAD, go ahead and go for 32. My reasoning there is you want to buy something that you're not going to have to upgrade or touch inside of that, that three-year lifespan. Obviously, you know, if you're using huge models, a lot more software, you can go up from 32 but that should be a pretty good specification for purchasing new machines over the next several years. Important things to note, your processor will have a certain number of memory slots 
that can be populated with RAM. Uh, some may have two. Most, if you're in an i7 or a Xeon processor, are going to have four memory slots. You want to put the same size and speed memory in every memory slot. If you want 16 gigabytes and you have four slots, put in four four gigabyte modules, not two eights. Now there's some debate, well, okay, maybe I can get more RAM 30 days from now. Okay, I, I might buy that. But it, it seems to be that once you buy the machine, it's very difficult to upgrade it. So go ahead and get the RAM that you need, get it in there now. Everything spec the same size, the same speed, filling all available memory slots equally, and you will get the best performance from your processor. Now, one of the biggest things uh, that, that's really happening right now uh, is some severe leaps in solid-state disk performance, and I, I want to make sure everybody understands this. Uh, solid-state disks have been around you know, for really a couple years, you know, that, that they've been commonly available. But some of the performance strides that we're starting to see now really are worth mentioning. Now, the, the brand new technology, uh, which is being pushed out presently from Samsung, is called NVMe, or you will sometimes see it referred to as M.2. These solid state disks basically are like the size of a RAM module. Uh, they don't even look like a, uh, a hard disk at all much more compact, much smaller, and if we compare them to say a Samsung 850 drive that we would have bought two years ago, running at about 500 megabyte random read, these are now operating at about two gigabit random read. They literally are four times faster than the solid state disk that you bought two years ago or 18 months ago, and they are definitely worth it in CAD machines. Uh, they're going to be your boot device, the sweet spot seems to be about 500 gigabit, uh, gigabytes. rather. So that would be your boot device. Your operating system would be on it. Your CAD software would be installed on it. And I even like to use my active models that I'm working on. I like to have them in the solid state disk as well. I do typically specify my machines with maybe a one terabyte magnetic disk, which is nothing now. That's $150 tops. And that can be viewed as your backup or your offline storage. This is definitely worth doing. I mean, there, don't buy a high performance machine with a lot of high performance RAM and then boat anchor it because it's trying to use a mechanical hard drive. These new solid state disks truly are worth it. Don't make your expensive computer wait on a $150 disk. Go ahead and take the plunge and put in the extra $250 that it takes and get these high performance SSDs in there. Uh, I want to show you a way that you can benchmark this uh, just because a lot of times I, I know when we go and ask for something, the answer is kind of immediately no. And especially if we, we tend to talk about bits and bytes and things like that. If you turn on your task manager, in Windows and then click on the resource monitor, this type of screen will pop up. And what we can see here is I've got this benchmarked out of a machine that is a conventional drive machine, but it does have a 32 gig ready boost. Um, so it's operating a lot better than most just traditional hard disk type systems would be operating at. And what we can see here is something very interesting. In the top screen or, or graph that you see over there on the right, you can see that the CPU is really only operating at about 50% um, of its capacity. But if you look at the second graphic down, you'll see that the disk very often goes up to 100% of its capacity. And if you look coincidentally, you will see that the areas where the disk goes up to very high use, you will typically see the CPU dip down. And the one place where the CPU is 100% utilized is the place where the disk was basically idle. Now what this means is that the CPU is waiting on the disk. If you were to put a solid state disk drive in this machine and rerun this resource monitor, you would see exactly the opposite. You would see the disk being almost flat down around the 10 to 20% demand mark and you would see the CPU almost pegged at 100%. 
that's because the CPU would now not be waiting on the disk. This is a very good way to graphically uh, show this point to somebody. So if you have a machine with a solid state disk, do the benchmark on both machines. Show your IT staff that and, and let them see the difference in performance. It pictures worth a thousand words. So just wanted to make sure that I mentioned that. The last component uh, that a lot of people actually, they tend to talk about a lot more in a CAD machine has to do with graphics. Now, one thing that we can do when we buy a new Intel processor, and that's going to be on the i7s or the Xeons, is a lot of them have what's called onboard graphics. And these are professional graphics. They're certified by Autodesk. They're not the highest performance. This is true. So if you're, if you're a rendering hotshot or you produce animations, that's not what you want. But if you're a, a 2D user with very casual 3D demands, it may be all that you need. For base modeling type users, I would say a one to two gigabyte PCIe, you know, professional graphics processor, something that is Autodesk certified. I, I really want to say that because a lot of people go out and buy gaming cards and then they have some degree of problems with it when they're trying to run rendering uh, through professional CAD products. So something that's Autodesk certified in the one to two gigabyte range is probably your best choice and not that expensive. If you're doing high res where you need huge frame buffers and, and a lot more performance, then of course you can start looking at the more expensive cards, four gigabytes and up. One thing that I will say is, unlike a processor, unlike the RAM, um, graphics cards are something that can be updated later. Uh, you could buy a machine initially and just use the onboard graphics see how that serves you and if your user is outgrowing it you can put in um, a, a higher performance graphics processor board later so it, it is something that you can try to save a little money on up front and then you can go ahead and power it up later if you like so what I would say for anybody who's planning you know I, you'll notice that I went through this in processor RAM hard disk and then graphics order, and that's what I feel are the three priorities. In order to prevent obsolescence, in order to get a machine that's going to run well for you for at least a three-year time span, you want to probably buy more machine today than you really need today. Models tend to get bigger, software tends to get more aggressive, and you're going to want some of that extra bandwidth or capacity. Make sure for the right processor with plenty of RAM, which is appropriately sized, inspect and populated in all RAM slots with an SSD. I can't, I can't say it any more strongly. Every machine that you buy from now on should have a high performance NVMe based solid state disk. It's absolutely mandatory. Don't buy anything without it. And you can skimp on the graphics a little bit. Maybe that would give you the couple hundred dollars of wiggle room that you need to talk your IT department into the solid state disk. Right? Let's look at a quick return on investment because any time that you ask for new hardware, I think this is important. You can think about trying to justify a new computer in a couple of different ways. You can talk about, well, this is really cool, you know, look at all the bits and bytes and megaflops and kill, you know, gigahertz and all that. And the problem is your chief financial officer probably doesn't understand that, or your engineering manager probably doesn't understand that. What they do understand is money. So this is typically how I ask for a new computer. I say, what does the engineering hour cost? What does it cost for the user who's sitting in front of the machine? How many hours could we save that person if we put a really fast machine on their desktop? How many hours would we save them if we looked at that over a three-year time span? And if you look at it this way, a $2,500 machine, which is going to be a very nice machine, is actually cheap. Do the math, and you'll see that to be so. So what if an engineering hour is $65? And we could save that or, or buy that person the $2,500 machine, and in so doing, we could save them one hour per week. Well, that would be 144 hours 
saved over a span of three years, which is $9,360 if you look at the engineering labor rate of $65 per hour. Now, it doesn't take too much to see that over a three-year span, you're getting a 374% return on that new computer. Take this, put this in front of your engineering managers, put, drop it on their desk in spreadsheet form, and watch how much differently they think about requesting a new computer when you put things in dollars and cents terms. Or another way you can look at it is, how long will it take me to pay for that computer? Well, if you look at $2,500 and you divide it by $65 per hour, you're going to figure out that it's going to take you 9.6 months to buy that machine back. And from an IT point of view, anything that pays for itself in two years or under is typically a good investment. So try this. Um, when you're specifying new machines, you're specifying this more robust, uh, admittedly more expensive engineering graphics-based machine with high-performance RAM and solid-state disk. Use this math to back up your request and show them why every high-performance user should have a high-performance workstation on their desk. And I think you'll see that the reception is a little bit different. So the takeaway really for what's coming up right now is while hardware has always gotten faster and cheaper, we really are seeing some pretty interesting and disruptive technologies in the hardware market in this coming year. Stuff that's just going to be way, way higher performance than what we had access to at the beginning of last year. Um, so there's really no reason to labor along on slow workstations, and there's no reason to buy something that's slow now. Make sure you specify the right stuff. So again, I've not been able to really monitor the chat panel. Um, Craig, have we got anything coming in, or should I keep going? Um, we have a question um, asking about the Autodesk licensing and asking if Autodesk is going to be uh, hosting licenses themselves uh, next year or in the near future. So the short answer for that is, is they are not um, planning on rolling that out, or at least we don't know of that at this point. So everything is going to continue to be licensed uh, locally on your own networks or your own, or your own workstations. Yes, and probably one thing I should have mentioned is that you can you can have a mixture, a, a you know, a mishmash of some perpetuals and some rental licenses, and they are moving forward with technology that will allow all that to be tracked through a single license server. So I, you know, I've and, and Craig, you may have more up-to-date information on that than I do, but it it looks as if you're going to be able to have a mixture of perpetual and rentals. And it's really not going to be administratively any more difficult than it has been in the past. Now, verify. Yes, that. that yes. Yeah, that is that is correct. They're they're planning on using the same FlexLM uh, licensing technology for both the uh, desktop um, as well as the network uh, desktop subscription licenses when those become available. Good deal. So you're hearing the same thing I am. That's good. Right. Right. Good to know. So should I go ahead, or do we have anything else right now? There's no other question, so you may proceed. OK, we'll go ahead. So two legs of the stool complete, and now we're, we're moving to our final two. And one of those critical things you know, has, has to do with your work processes. And then the next one we'll cover, training. And this process and training thing kind of works together. But we'll go ahead and, and tackle the, uh, the process piece of it first. You know, you can have great software, you can have great hardware, but if you don't know what you're doing, it's not going to make a lot of difference. And I've seen places that, that do purchase the latest and greatest. You know, they say, well, we have, we have the greatest tools, but they don't have any sort of best practices or training programs, so it's a lot of trial and error. And uh, you're clearly not getting the most out of your software ecosystem if you don't have well-optimized processes. So let's talk a little bit about how CAD managers, power users, uh, you know, can help to facilitate getting better processes in place. Well, I think the first thing is ask this rhetorical question. Why is it 
you let me buy all this hardware and software, but you don't let me standardize it. You don't let me derive great processes. You don't let me have a training program. Uh, you need to start asking that question and asking it in just about that manner because a lot of times your management may not be aware that they're doing that. Um, so it, the burden's on us, you know, the, the CAD champions, the burden is on us to make sure that we raise this issue. And I think one of the first things that we all need to recognize is that just because you have tools doesn't mean you get great results. Um, you know, give a hammer to somebody who's never swung one before and what you're going to get is a broken sum, not a well-constructed house. So we're going to have to have great processes to make the tools work well. So what should we be looking at? How should we be looking at software tools? We should be looking at them as what Jim Collins likes to call software accelerators. And I'll, I'll dig into that a little bit more here in a moment. Software should accelerate your design. It should allow you to get projects done faster than you got them done without the software. Okay, so if you get new software that has great new features, it's only really going to pay off for you though if your project is well managed and if your software usage is defined and standardized. Then, and only then, can you train people how to use the software and get the benefit of those best practices. So you have to think about how the software is going to work, and you have to manage your projects in a way that allows the tools to work for you, not against you. Now here's this idea of a technology accelerator. Anytime, if you're like me, anytime you get a new uh, maintenance release of a piece of software, you know, you, you, you're like, oh boy, goody, Christmas morning, I'm going to install it, and I'm going to start having a look at it. And probably you as, as a, you know, CAD champions and power users, I'm sure you do this as well. As you go through that new software, evaluating it in your own mind, you're going to look for things that allow you to accelerate your business, that serve client needs, that will increase your quality. So if you perform some sort of architectural design and one of the, the really cool things that you are offering your clients is you're optimizing heat transfers through glass and you're doing passive solar and lead certification, you may look at a new release of Revit and you may ask yourself, what does this bring to bear for us from an energy calculation or an energy analysis point of view? So if there's new features there, that's going to be of great interest to you. It's going to be of great interest to your clients and it's going to allow you to do better designs for them. So it will be an accelerator for your business and your customer's business. These are features that you want to focus on with laser-like intensity because they really speak to what you do. So when you analyze those types of, of features and you find out what you want to focus on, what you now want to do is figure out how to get those new features integrated into your processes. And the, the technique or technology that I like to use there, I call a pilot project. Some people will call it a test project. It, it's really kind of immaterial what you call it. But my point is, I'm going to get it into testing. And I'm going to get these new features working with a small sample group of people so that I can get them working as quickly as possible and figure out whether it's really going to make sense for us in our business environment. So in order to run a good pilot project, here's just some, some punch item things you'll need to do. You'll need to find out who your test pilots are. And these will be your users who are helping you run the new software through its training, you know, through, through the processes of, of trying to break it, all that kind of stuff, and see how these new features are really going to work. You'll need to identify a test project now that's probably not an overly simple project, but nor is it your most complex project. It's something of medium complexity, something that's in your organization's wheelhouse so that you can put new features to bear on it and you can really gauge, does that help us? You know, is, it, is it really making us faster? Is it really allowing us to execute this project faster than we would have using the old technology? You'll need to understand what your proof of concept is. 
So if you're analyzing new energy management features, your proof of concept will be, can we get a more optimized design using the new energy calculation tools in this version of the software? You'll now need to figure out what project you're using that in and when you'll be able to actually test it. And that will be based on resources when your test pilots are available. So that timeline is something that you're going to have to think about. And then you'll have to define what, what I like to call a grading rubric, which is how are we going to measure this? At, at the end of the project, are we defining success based on fewer man hours? Um, are we defining it on prettier renderings for our clients? Okay. You have to think about how you'll analyze what your degree of success was. Once you know these five things, you can set up a pilot project that should allow you to prove any new software release or set of features that you want to use inside your company and see whether it really makes sense for you. Now, what you'll get after you run this pilot project is you will identify which new software tools or which features within those tools are really going to work for your company. You will have created new processes in conjunction with your test pilots, so you're actually figuring out the best way to use these new features. And if you take notes as you go through this process, you will realize from your test pilots what the key training points were. I always like to recommend because I do, you know, I, I help do training. Is I always write down what confused me whenever I learn something new, because I figure if it confused me, chances are it's probably going to confuse somebody else as well. So write that down. Talk to your your uh, test pilots and make sure that they're giving you pointers on what the key training points are going to be. And you'll also have a sample project that actually gets generated so you'll be able to look at deliverable files and make sure that everything works. If this pilot project goes well, you should have a very high degree of confidence that this software will actually work for you in a production environment, that is with your real users, the other, the other people, not just your test pilots, but everybody else who's out there around your organization. And this should make it so much simpler to roll it out and train it, which we'll be talking about here in a moment. So getting great results with software, it's not an accident. It doesn't just happen. You have to analyze new pieces of software and their key features. You have to figure out which ones are going to be accelerators for your company. You then have to test it, tweak it, and put it in a test environment so that you can crash it, do whatever it is that you're going to have to do to learn how to make that software function in your organization. If you don't do this pilot project methodology and you just release new software to everybody in your organization, it's going to take you much more time because you're going to try to fight through all this with many users as opposed to a smaller sampling of users. So as a CAD administrator, um, I've always been a big fan of get your test pilots on this thing, you know, run it, crash it, figure it out, then roll it out to the general population. I think you'll see that you'll be far, far more successful if you approach it in that way. Now we probably, there's usually not really a whole lot of questions about this, but Craig, did we have anything come in in this section of the, the talk? No, we didn't have any questions about this section. There were a couple of follow-up questions on the desktop subscription licensing that I'll mention. One of them was just confirming that Autodesk uh, will have network licenses of the new desktop subscription licenses available or not, and the answer for that is they have announced that they will have desktop um, or network licenses of uh, the individual products available sometime early next year. Uh, they have not yet formally announced that they'll have the suites available as network licenses, uh, but we kind of anticipate they will. Uh, so that was one follow-up question on the desktop subscription. Okay. And be, beyond that, um, I think uh, I think we're good. Okay, and I'm sure we'll probably get some more questions about that, but we'll just do that in final wrap-up here shortly. Okay, sounds good. Okay, talk to you in a minute then. All right, we'll go ahead and advance. So the last thing that I want to mention is your training program. Uh, and you do have one, right? 
he asks rhetorically. Uh, you absolutely must have a training program because really I think that that's probably the strongest of the four legs in the stool. If you're not teaching people how to use things correctly, they're going to struggle, they're going to improvise, they're going to find out their own ad hoc methodologies, and you're going to have a mess on your hands. So if, if any of you have, have ever presided over that, you're sitting out there in, behind your computer nodding your head. Um, so a training program of some sort is absolutely critical. Um, I, I see in, in industry all the time companies that buy the software, buy the hardware, you know, they have the CAD administrator, um, you know, they have people trying to figure out how to best do all this stuff, but then they quote, don't have time to train. Well, what's the point of doing any of the rest of it if you don't have time to train people the right way in which to work? So I'd like to mention a few things about getting a training program that's right-sized, right-scaled, and cost-effective um, inside of your company. And then we'll move to a general question and answer session where we can wrap everything up. So the first thing would be training's not an accident. It needs to be planned for, just like anything else. You can't just say, we're going to have training tomorrow. You need to know what you're actually doing. So let me give you some key planning points that I always try to stick with. First of all, you're teaching people um, how to use certain specific software features. Now, let's imagine that your company is going from AutoCAD to Revit. You're going to have a lot of people who are going to need to know how to use the core features in Revit. And my question to you as a CAD administrator is, do you have time to develop that class? Do you really have time to put together the books and the videos and all the mentoring sessions and everything that you're going to need to do in order to teach that course? And the answer for most of us is no. Sub this out. Um, call somebody at Midwest CAD and say, I want to arrange some sort of a customized training class for my users. Here are the features that I need you to explain to my users, and I want to create a custom syllabus class and I want you guys to deliver it for me so that my users can be effective and get up to speed in this new software quickly. Almost everybody who's a CAD manager or CAD administrator does not have time to do this. And if they do do it on their own, they typically don't do it real well. Go hire somebody who does this all the time and knows. And I guarantee you, if you call Midwest CAD and ask them to put together a custom one-day training class for you, They'll do it, they'll be happy to do it, and they'll be able to pull that together for you much more quickly than you can do it for yourself. Um, put, put Craig on point there, I'm, I'm almost positive Craig will tell you they'd be happy to do that. Um, what you need to focus your time on is what I call custom training. These are things that are based on your standards and processes. You can create your own syllabus for, okay, we're going to have a training session on how we plot. Here's what our plotting devices are, here's where they are on the network, here's how we do our page setups, et cetera. You create your, your own syllabus, you conduct this training internally to your people, and you can video record it if you like, or you can do training handouts, or you can go into a conference room and train one lunch hour every month. The methodology by which you do it, it's not important. The point is, if it's very custom, and very specific to your business, that's the stuff you want to spend your time on. Take the stuff that's more generic, sub that out to somebody who does that all day, every day. But do not skip training, because if you skip training, you will never get any type of standardization or best practices culture in place. If you turn 10 people loose, they'll do it 10 different ways, and you'll spend all day, every day, trying to figure out why you're having problems. And the core reason is lack of standardization and training. So I, I, I can't make that point strongly enough. So what we just did was we planned our training. Now what you do is train your plan. Key execution points okay, for when you're actually running training. Training should be brief but continuous. Don't train people one day once a year. Train people one hour every month every year far better 
to deliver training in small modular little pieces and dribs and drabs because human beings being the way they are their attention spans roughly an hour um, so it's always going to work better to do that short sessions definitely work best focus on methods not features don't say we're going to learn the plot command now say we're going to learn what our plot standards are that, that's much better you're showing people how to work not how to delve into a software tool you're showing them how to work using a software tool the goal of any training is to get people to work better to make fewer errors and be more productive if a training class is not making people more productive or lowering rework costs there's no reason to have it the goal of training is more productivity less rework simply put if you fashion your training in a way that makes people more productive then the training pays for itself your boss is going to say why should I have all my people sitting in your training class because that's an hour they can't work and your answer is because I will make them four or six or ten hours more productive over the course of the next year if you give me one hour to train them and uh, kind of coming back to some business metrics but that tends to work. It's all about making the training short, bite-sized, and focusing on your standards, methods, processes. That's what makes training a positive financial investment. The conclusion that I would draw is that if you train people generically on software, what they'll do is they'll get in and they'll start using the software in many, many different ways, which you can't necessarily predict. But if you put them on a piece of software and you show them how to work with your processes using contextual examples that make sense to them, like your buildings, your standard projects, they're going to learn the right way to work. And they're going to learn what your standard processes are. If that's part of your training program and you do this on a continual basis, you will see a huge leap in, in people's productivity over time. Funny. If you show them the right way to work they might actually work the right way so as we move to a closing Q&A we talked about these four legs of the stool right your software technology and specifically some licensing changes coming from Autodesk your hardware environment proving software features and technology via pilot projecting and understanding technology accelerator concepts and blending it all into a training environment that puts your users in a real-world scenario so they learn how to use the tools in the best way in your company. If you do the planning on those four key metric areas, you will do well. I can promise that you will. So keep asking these questions, how do we do things better around here, and you will keep getting better. But it won't happen by accident. It only happens if you're attentive and you keep planning for it. So let's go ahead and uh, move over to any questions that Craig may have gathered for us. And then, Craig, I understand you'll be doing our wrap-up, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, Robert. I guess um, we have uh, one question I'll address. I, I, I do want to comment on your training uh, section of your presentation. Yes, please uh, do. Just that the, just that the um, return on investment calculation that you did earlier for hardware we often use something pretty similar to help folks with justification of training uh, because a lot of the thing, things, same things apply. And I would just encourage everybody uh, listening to uh, use a similar methodology when it comes to uh, considering training. Beyond that, good. Um, so I do have a question that came in uh, here for the wrap up. Um, Somebody asking what we think is the likelihood of future subscription costs when you start comparing desktop subscription to the existing maintenance subscription. And they, um, Autodesk really you know, hasn't said anything formally. Um, I guess our uh, opinion at Midwest CAD is, is there probably in the future as Autodesk continues a march toward desktop subscription they will have various methods to uh, lessen the difference between maintenance subscription and desktop subscription, whether that's lowering desktop subscription pricing 
um, through specials or promotions or perhaps raising maintenance subscription. Those we think are possibilities, but those are um, things that are pretty far in the future uh, for now. And uh, for the most part, uh, we still believe the lowest cost, total cost of ownership on, on, on software, Autodesk software, will be through uh, perpetual licensing with maintenance subscription. Beyond that, uh, we don't have any other questions. And I certainly want to uh, then lead into wrapping up the meeting. I want to thank Robert and everyone in the audience for your time and attention today. We hope you learned some new ideas or maybe just validated some of your existing practices. Um, again, I encourage you to reach out to anybody here at Midwest CAD to help you apply these principles, help you maximize your investments. And with that, um, again, thank you everyone for attending, and we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Have a good day.